Lucky. Are you alright? Too much water. How we doing, boys? I don't know why it sounded like that, but great films don't come once in a generation. But every so often, a movie comes along that perfectly encapsulates the themes of love, friendship, and family. A movie that is just as marvelous of a feat of writing, acting, and directing, as well as the obvious visual spectacle that comes from quality films of any era. These films capture the hearts and imaginations of millions of people and can be shared for generations to come as a timeless form of entertainment. The movie we're discussing today is not that. Nuki is a South African science fiction film from 1987 and is considered by most who have seen it to be a pretty obvious ripoff of Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial. And look, I don't want to spoil too much, but this movie has it all. A couple of nasty little goblin freaks, two brothers, a talking chimp, and a giraffe? Uh, I think this is the movie for me. You'd have to be a damn fool to pass up the opportunity to watch this movie. The movie begins with Nuki and his brother Miko flying around in space as little orbs of light. And at first you might think, oh, these are their ships. But no, it's literally them flying around as balls of pure energy. And remember that because it'll be important later. Miko and Nuki fly too close to Earth and they crash land with Miko landing in Florida and Nuki landing in the middle of the African savanna. And honestly, between the two of them, I don't really know who has it worse. Miko is quickly captured by NASA, which in this movie is called the Space Foundation for some reason. Miko sends a telepathic message to Nuki that he's being held captive in America and begs Nuki to come and rescue him. And look, before we get too much further, we gotta talk about how Nuki and Miko look, because what the hell even is this thing? Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? These guys are disgusting little weirdos, and frankly, I hope they get E.T. sickness and they don't make it out. It's also especially jarring in these shots of Nuki running around in the wilderness. He looks like one of those peanut people from the Proud Family movie. Nuki and Miko's race has the ability to telepathically learn any language, including the language of animals. So Nuki tries to talk to several animals to figure out where America is, but the only animals who talk to him are these rude-ass baboons. The king baboon tells Nuki that humans may be able to help him, but to be careful, because they're dangerous. Which, you know, fair. Nuki also runs into these twin brothers, Tiko and Toki, and tries to get them to help him. But upon seeing this wretched creature, they run away from him and vow to never speak of this again. Which is precisely what I would do if I ever ran into this little freak. But here's the thing. While Nuki is out gallivanting in the wilderness, he shows multiple times that he has the ability to teleport and fly. Like, crashing on Earth hasn't stopped this ability. So if he can do that, and Miko was flying around in space with him at the beginning, it stands to reason that Miko should also be able to teleport, right? I don't know, maybe maybe Nuki and Miko have like different powers or something. Except back at the Space Federation, the scientists discover something very interesting about Miko, that he's a being of pure energy. I don't exactly know what that means, but I suspect that's why he and Nuki have the ability to transform into balls of light and fly around. It also seems to explain how Nuki can just disappear and reappear at will wherever he wants to. But if this is the case, Miko definitely has the ability to escape his imprisonment here. Why is he just letting these guys torture him? The only explanation that I have for Miko just letting these guys torture him even though he has the ability to escape is that Miko has some very repressed kinks that he needs to work out for himself. And you could try to defend him and say, oh, but Isaiah, they're running experiments on him. He's too weak. Except he isn't because he's still able to telepathically communicate with Nuki, who is on the other side of the planet. This movie is stupid and it's making me mad. Next scene. Back in Africa, we're introduced to Sister Anne, who runs a missionary outside of Tiko and Toki's village. She and this guy, who I'm pretty sure is only ever referred to as the Corporal, also seem to run this small supply shop together and have a chimp named Charlie. And Charlie talks, but it's hard to understand if other humans can hear him talk or if it's just one of those things that Nuki does. I'm inclined to think it's just Nuki, but it's kind of unclear. 
We're also introduced to Dr. Eric Harvey, a scientist from the Space Foundation who was sent to research Nuki's potential crash site. Sister Anne doesn't like him though, because she says something about the excitement of his arrival riling up the villagers too much or something stupid like that, I, I, I don't know. Nuki saves Tico and Toki from a mountain lion and they agree to help him get to America in any way that they can. And Nuki thinks that the best way to do that is to steal Dr. Harvey's helicopter, which he proceeds to crash. This man is a fucking menace and he needs to be stopped. What are you doing, Nuki? You don't have a pilot's license. What made you think that you could have flown that? At the Space Foundation, Miko begins to make friends with a supercomputer named Eddie. This is not part of my program. That's no program. How can you talk to me like that? Ooh, what are you doing to me? We are becoming friends which shows even further that Miko is capable of getting out of his enclosure. So what the hell is he still doing here? Just get out of there. Miko tells Eddie to scan for Nuki so that he can get an exact location, but I don't really know what he plans on doing with that information since he's apparently trapped here. Back in Africa, Tiko and Toki get banished from their village for bringing Nuki into their midst because the villagers think that Nuki is a god of evil. But I mean, just look at this guy. He, he looks like something. Nuki's not exactly a creature that that you look at and get the vibes of like, yeah, that's a good sign. Nuki finds Toki and Tiko wandering the wilderness and helps them start a fire. They ask him what it's like among the stars and he describes the freedom that he gets when he's flying around in space. The kids begin to get tired and Nuki tells them that he'll help them get to sleep the way kids on his home planet go to sleep and proceeds to do the most insane dance number I've ever seen before exploding into fireworks and then casting a sleep spell on them. So then why didn't he just do the sleep spell first? I like to think that Nuki was just trying to show off his dance routine to some and was just kind of like, you like this? Does it look good? I just really wanted to get like somebody's approval. It looks good, right? Okay, cool. Back at the Space Foundation, we get this weird scene of Eddie falling in love with a scientist named Pamela. And uh, I don't think we ever hear anything about that again. And then we just go right back to Africa. So I don't I don't really know what the point was of, of this scene. I mean, maybe to establish that Eddie is developing feelings. I don't know, it's weird. Nuki goes back to Tiko and Toki's village to try and convince them to take the boys back and then is promptly tackled to the ground. But he escapes by possessing a dirt bike, which, okay, so if, so if Nuki was capable of doing that, why didn't he just do that when he tried to possess the helicopter? Why hasn't he tried to possess any other vehicle that's capable of traveling at a speed that's faster than just running around the wilderness? Nuki is an idiot. I hate this stupid little gremlin more with each passing minute. After crashing the dirt bike and vandalizing the village some more, Nuki disappears into the night. Back at the Space Foundation, Eddie is doing some calculations and gets bored and tells Miko to come chill with him, which again, I guess he's capable of doing. Why is he still here? Miko and Eddie start chilling and then before you know it, they're having a little dance party. Actually, it's a circus. They, they call it a circus for, for some reason. Miko manipulates the lead scientist's brainwaves and makes him believe that he he's a circus clown. So now we've established that Miko not only has the ability to teleport and fly, he also has the ability to directly manipulate people's brains. And you would think that this entire scene ends with Miko finally making his escape, right? I mean, he has the lead scientist on the ropes and there's nobody that can stop him, but this entire scene just ends with Miko going back into his fucking box. Nuki's planet probably didn't have a Charles Darwin, but this one did. And this is a process that we call natural selection. Just kill him and get it over. This other scientist catches their little dance party and puts a stop to their fun, after which Eddie tells her that she sucks, which is actually genuinely funny. You know something, lady? You suck. In Africa, Toki and Tiko are still wandering the wilderness, and Toki gets bitten by a fucking cobra. And luckily, Dr. Harvey just so happens to be nearby in his chopper, and he and the corporal load him into Harvey's helicopter to get him to the mission's hospital as quickly as possible. But after Tiko is taken away by Harvey, Nuki tries to chase after the chopper to help him. Toki tries to explain the situation, but is too upset to get any words out. And then the corporal loads Nuki up with three tranks that look like they could take out a bull elephant. At the Space Foundation, Eddie tells the lead scientist to stop the experiments because they're killing Miko. But she just laughs it off and says that she's gonna report him to IBM. I guess the computer developing incredibly advanced AI is a major issue and they wanna see if it voids the warranty. Miko uses Eddie again to try and reach Nuki and finds Toki who begs Miko to help Nuki. But Miko says it's all up to Toki 
Loki and that he has to hurry because apparently he and Nuki aren't used to being on Earth and time is running out for them. Although he also doesn't really say what will happen if they don't leave. None of this makes any sense. I mean, it makes sense that Miko looks like he's about to fucking keel over because the government has been experimenting on it. But Nuki seems like he's totally fine. I don't, I don't understand what's happening. Toki sneaks into the corporal's truck as he takes Nuki away and manages to get Nuki free. But as they're running away, the corporal shoots into the brush after them. Nuki sneaks into Tiko's hospital room and heals him from the cobra bite. But then Toki and Nuki dip the hell out of there because somehow Tiko is going to get Nuki to America. Meanwhile, Miko tries to convince Eddie to set him free, which I don't understand because again, why can't he just teleport away like we've seen Nuki do at this point a hundred times? After a very strange montage of Toki and Nuki just wandering through the African wilderness, we discover that Miko has escaped his captivity with the help of Dr. Carter by sneaking out in a trash can. And literally just like that, the entire experiment is canceled. All of the documents become classified and nobody even bothers looking that hard for Miko. I mean, it, he was literally in a trash can, dude. Just, just search the dumpster and you'll find him. This lady, Dr. Carter, gets in touch with Dr. Harvey and escapes from the Space Foundation with Miko, and the three of them begin to make their way towards Africa. As Toki and Nuki travel the wilderness, the corporal catches up to them. But before he can catch them, they pull a fast one on him and manage to steal his car away from him. Except they immediately crash it into a river and Nuki fucking dies. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but like, look, just look at this fucking scene, dude. Man is floating face down in the river and then goes down a series of three waterfalls and rapids and washes up on the shore like 20 minutes later. Yeah, Nuki somehow survives this and he tells Tiko that since Tiko had the ability to talk to Miko, he has the ability to fly like Nuki and Miko do. And using the power of friendship, Tiko and Nuki manage to fly a short distance before Nuki crashes from exhaustion because apparently he's getting the earth sickness. And just when all hope is lost and Nuki is on death's door, Tiko makes a wish for he and Nugi to be reunited with their families and for everything to be okay. Which is exactly when the nun from the missionary pulls up with Tiko's family and Harvey arrives with Miko to this random location in the middle of the African wilderness. Yay, it's a reunion. Just don't think about it too hard. After a tearful goodbye, Nuki and Miko head back into space taking Charlie the chimpanzee with them for some reason and ending their reign of terror forever. This movie sure was a trip. Um, it was a trip I didn't want to go on. You know, you know, I, you know, I went into the car kicking and screaming and, and biting and calling people names. But I think that we all learned something really important from this movie. And that's if you're in a situation that you really don't want to be in, um, and you, and you have the ability to get yourself out of it, um, just don't. Um, wait, wait, wait for somebody else to do it. You know, you, you probably got a lot on your plate. So, you know, I get it. If you like this video, consider subscribing to the channel and giving me a like, leave a comment and share this with people who you think might enjoy it. All of those things really help me out a lot. Lately, the channel has been growing a lot quicker than I ever anticipated. And I just want to thank you guys so much for it. And always, my name is Isaiah and thank you so much for watching my video.